Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us through your word. We thank you that you talk to us through your word. I pray in, in this Sunday morning as we're all gathered here as church family, that your spirit would un, just reveal and, and unveil things in our hearts that maybe, God, we didn't even know were there. And Lord, you want to help us, you want to encourage us, you want to shape us and change us. So Lord, I pray that you would talk to us today. May we hear from you. May these be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. You could say that timing is everything. How many of you are musicians in here? Raise your, raise your hand. So some of you are musicians. Music that is not in the right time or maybe somebody lacks rhythm and they try to play music, it's pretty, it's pretty terrible, like we're going to be honest, right? <laughs> and I, you know, for those of you that have no rhythm, you know what? Jesus loves you. It's all good. It's no problem. But for those of us that are musically inclined, we know that timing is important. We know that keeping on beat is important. The right timing could make or break a song. You could even say that timing is also important for conversation. If you're, if you're a person that maybe has awkward pauses, it's not the right timing, right? <laughs> you're like, uh, uh. or you're a person that, that, that maybe interrupts or, or you just don't have the right timing in the conversation, or maybe you know the right time to have a hard conversation and the wrong time to have a hard conversation conversation that can make or break the outcome of what you're trying to tell them or what you're trying to do when god has his timing it is always perfect god is never late you're just early god is never early he's always on time and what we're going to be talking about today is that when God does something, he does things for a specific reason at a specific time for a specific purpose. And we're going to discover here in Acts chapter 3 that timing really is everything. So let's go ahead and turn to Acts 3. Again, background of Acts chapter 2. 3,000 people get saved. The church is exploding. You have the main gathering at the temple. You have the house churches that are going on. They're all being led by the Spirit. And God is pouring out His Spirit in amazing ways. Like you had the people speaking in native languages. And everybody was hearing the works of God and what God was doing. And it was an amazing thing. And God is going to do something even more next. So this is roughly, you know, a few months after Jesus has risen from the dead. He's gone to heaven. The disciples and the apostles, they are now starting church. Like church has officially begun. And we're going through the book of Acts because we're a brand new church. This is Sunday number five, which I'm very excited about. This is Sunday number five, and the book of Acts has some very unique lessons that I believe that we can learn as a new church, as a church family. So let's pick it up in verse one of chapter three. Now, Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, so roughly mid-afternoon, and a lame man from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. And so this man, he is lame from birth, and if you were paralyzed back in the day, it was immediate poverty. There was no disability, there was no welfare, it literally... Your livelihood depended upon the immediate generosity of others. And so this man would be carried for roughly 40 years and be laid at the beautiful gate or the golden gate at the temple, and he was a beggar. That's the only way he could live. That was his life. Verse 3, and seeing Peter and John go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. So he's begging from Peter and John. And Peter directed his gaze at him as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. So the layman looks at Peter and John. He thinks he's going to get some money. And if you know the story, just pretend you don't know the story, okay? Just pretend you don't know the story. This is a normal, regular, average, boring day. He doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't know what's coming. God does the miraculous 
on regular boring days. It's only after the miracle does the day become special. Isn't that interesting? This man has been here for 40 years, and it's just one more, it's just one more asking for money. It's just one more day. It's just another day like every other day. But today is going to be different. Verse 6, Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have... What did Peter have? Well, he had the Spirit. He had Jesus. He said, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, I don't know about you, but that's really gutsy. Like, seriously, just think about it. If you, let's say that you go into a hospital and you just go up to some random person and, you, and they're paralyzed from the waist down and you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Like, that's kind of, like, what if nothing happens, right? <laughs> what if nothing goes down? What if, what if God doesn't move? See, this is an amazing step of faith. Peter doesn't have money, but what does he have? He has the power of God. I would rather say, silver and gold have I none, but I have Jesus. And Jesus I give to you. The church is so much better off to say, you know what, we don't have any money, but we have Jesus, and that's what we give to you. It's really terrible when a church has money and has silver and gold and does not have Jesus. That's terrible. Because there's nothing there to offer. There's nothing there to spiritually change anything. And again, Peter is bold. Now, I believe that God clearly spoke to Peter through the Spirit here in this instance because Peter followed through. And remember, Peter has seen Jesus do this a lot, right? This is a very familiar story for Peter. He's seen Jesus heal paralyzed people. He's seen Jesus heal a ton of people. And so Peter hears God he steps out in faith very boldly and very courageously, I might add. And then verse 7, And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately the lame man's feet, ankles, and feet were made strong. This is instant healing. You cannot fake this. I was talking to one of my friends who's a physical therapist, and we were talking about this passage. And as a physical therapist... He knows, like, look, if somebody is in this state, like the muscles aren't ready, like they're not fully formed, this is instant miracle. You cannot fake this at all. And so verse 8, and kids, this is, I need your help. Kids, I'm going to need your help. So just go ahead and get ready with your tray. You might have to put it aside for, for this. So just uh, get ready for the next part, kids. Verse 8. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. You know that old kids' ministry song? It's like, he went walking and leaping and praise. Anyways, you know that song? If you haven't heard it, um, YouTube it. It'll be great. But So kids, you ready? You guys ready? You guys ready? I want you, on the count of three, I want you to leap up. I want you to jump. You guys ready? So here we go. So kids in the back, kids in the back, kids in the front. Ready? So we do this at Boise Church. We like to get the kids involved. Ready? And one, two, three, he leapt. Ready? One, two, three. Whoop. Oh, okay. And adults, you know, you can do this too. I mean, I'm just saying, if you want. I'm just saying. So he, they, we're ready one more time. Ready? One, two, three. He leapt. One, two, three. Boop. Just jumped up, and then he was praising God and walking and leaping. He was jumping around. Now, you guys can jump around after church, okay? <laughs> you can jump around after church. And he jumps up, and he goes around the temple, and he is telling everybody what has happened. He's telling everybody that he was healed. And guess who notices? Everybody. Because everybody knows him. He's been there for 40 years. Everybody knows this guy. Everybody knows that he was paralyzed. Verse 9 and all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, you would be in wonderment as well. You would be like, that just happened. He was, but now he's not, whoa, what is going on? 
Here's something that's really amazing. Jesus healed tons of people, right? And Jesus, he tells Peter to go ahead and heal this guy. Now, the lame man was at the gate beautiful or the beautiful gate or the golden gate. And I have a couple of uh, pictures in there, Aaron, if you want to go to some of the next slides. So here is a map, like if, just to let you guys know. In this map, you can see the new gate, the Jaffa gate, and then if you look at the temple off to the right, there is the Golden Gate. And here is a picture of the reconstructed Golden Gate. So the, the actual Golden Gate where the lame man would have been is, is technically underneath this, but this was the reconstructed version that they built on top of it in like the six or 700s. And the gate is technically sealed. And for you Bible scholars, uh, you know what that means. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is the Eastern Gate as today. And on one side of the gate, according, uh, excuse me, according to Jewish tradition, would be the gate of repentance. So this is really cool. Ready? According to Jewish tradition, on one side of the gate, the Jews would go and pray for, to repent or to turn around their life, to turn away from sin and to turn to God. And then they would go to the other side of the gate, and it's the gate of mercy. Isn't that cool? So they would go to God and ask for repentance, and then God would grant them mercy mercy. That's the picture here. And this is the gate that Jesus also came through on a donkey triumphantly. This is the gate that Jesus entered through that triumphal uh, entry on, on the donkey. And that was the Palm Sunday and all that. Also, what happens here is that this gate was the most prominent gate that you would walk into the temple. So the vast majority of people would walk through this gate. And you might think, Scott, why are you telling us this? What is going on? Let me tell you something. This is amazing. I learn something new every single time I teach. I love it. Jesus, it is not unreasonable to assume. Pretty good bet. Jesus would have walked by this man because he was 40 years old many times, at least once on the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he did not heal him. Isn't that interesting? Why would Jesus walk past this man? Why would Jesus walk past him and not heal him? May I submit to you that the works of God in this man's life has a particular timing to it. That the timing of what God is doing in this man was not then. It was not at the triumphal entry. It wasn't at the, the dozens or the hundreds of times that Jesus would have walked through. I know that Jesus would not, he didn't heal him then, but you know what? God healed him now. And do you know why? I, I honestly kind of don't know, but I have a little inkling. I have a little inkling. It's because God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. God does heal people. We believe that at Boise Church. I've seen it. We've seen it. God does do that. And when God heals, we want to praise him for it. And when God says no, or maybe not yet to a healing, even though that it's hard, we still praise him. We still praise him for what he's doing because we say the words, God, you know best. And, and even though that we pray, and I would just encourage you guys, don't stop praying for people. Pray that God would move. Pray that God would do an amazing thing in their life. But God's timing might be a little different from ours. And for the Christian, this is the beautiful thing. If you're a Christian, if you're not healed now on earth, guaranteed that when you die, and the Bible says when you're absent from the body, you are with God, you are present with God, you are healed right then and there. So whether you are healed here on earth or whether you're healed when you go to heaven, ultimately, that's what happens. It was not the right time for this lame man to be healed until the moment that Peter and John were there. And Peter and John are going to do something pretty awesome. God is going to do some amazing things through this man. And here, 
it draws attention very quickly. Verse 11, And while the layman clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, rang together in the portico, or the porch, called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the, temple, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? And why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Peter points out something very, very important. Guys, it's not us. It's God, right? It's not because we're super religious. It's not because we have the power inside of us. It's not us. It's Jesus in us. It's not you when God uses you. It's God in you. What have you received that you have not been given, the Bible says? Whatever God has given you, it's for you. But remember, it's, it's from the Lord. So everything that we have is from God, and God uses us. Verse 13, And the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, and when he had, de when he had decided to release him. And again, Peter is starting to preach about the Old Testament guys like, look, the God of our fathers, the, the Jewish fathers of the faith, that God that we all serve, he is telling you, I approve of Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the hero. Verse 14, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. That would have been Barabbas. So instead of the hero or the Messiah of the Jewish faith, they asked for a murderer, verse 15, and you killed the author of life. Now, isn't that the most ironic verse you've ever read? You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead, and we are witnesses. Jesus rose from the dead, and we saw it. Verse 16, and his name, by faith in his name, the name of Jesus, has made this man strong whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health and in the presence of you all. It's not the, the faith in yourself. It's not the faith in faith. It is the faith in Jesus that has done this. And it took guts to say, you know, take him by the hand and pull him up and pray for him and to heal him. It took guts and faith and God honored that. Verse 17, and now brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as also did your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that this Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. In other words, Peter is saying, look, we know you didn't know. We know you didn't understand. But God is trying to reach you. That God predicted this would happen. God predicted that what would happen to Jesus did happen. Verse 19, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Repent, therefore, and turn back, so that your sins may be blotted out. Actually, verse 20 is my favorite verse, but they go together. Uh, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Do you sometimes feel in your Christian walk just meh? Or maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're, not, maybe you're just checking out this church thing and you're not really sure. And there is just something missing and you know it. There's something missing in your life and you can't put your finger on what it is. May I submit to you that it's Jesus that is missing in your life to forgive you of all your sins and everything that you've done wrong. And there's this crushing weight of that burden of guilt that is on you because, because you're carrying your own sin. You're carrying your own, your own weight of the sin. And Jesus is saying, I want to take that from you. I want to forgive you. And that times of refreshing may come from your presence. Now, this is just like getting a cup of cold water on a really hot day. It's just so right? One of my favorite drinks is an Arnold Palmer with, you know, unsweet tea and a little bit of lemon, a little bit of lemonade. Yeah, I just, that's amazing, right? It is so good on a hot summer day. It's refreshing. And I want to encourage you, if you're not a Christian, I want to, or I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what Jesus has done for you. If you are a Christian, it is possible. Again, I believe this verse is not just for, for unbelievers, but also for believers. If you're a Christian, it is possible for you to have not turned to God or repented in a long time. Repented is not a one and done deal. Repentance is something that happens regularly, where we regularly 
turn what, away from what we're doing, and we turn to God. We regularly turn to what God is doing. We turn to Jesus. And when we purposefully turn to God, the Bible promises here that you will be refreshed. For some of you, you've been looking for that for a long time. And maybe you're even a Christian, you've been looking at that for a long time. The answer to get that refreshment is to turn away from what you're doing and turn to the Lord, even as a Christian. Even as a Christian. And it doesn't mean that, that you're not saved. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that you need to reconnect with God. That you need to reconnect with God in that way and you will be refreshed from God's presence. And verse 21 Um, Let's just read actually the last part of verse 20. Uh, And that he may ascend the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoring for all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his prophets long ago. So Jesus goes to heaven, and he's talking about that Jesus is being predicted to do all these things by the prophets long ago. Verse 22, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. Ouch. It's kind of rough. Now, you could say that Jesus had Moses' like power, but maybe a better way to say it would be that Moses had Jesus like power. See, Moses was, did an amazing, amazing thing. He did signs, miracles, he was a powerful messenger of God. But the Bible says that the prophet, or the prophet, Jesus, We need to listen to him or be destroyed. Now, that might sound a little vindictive, and you might say, well, if if God is going to destroy me if I don't turn to him, that sounds like I don't really have a choice, right? Like, sounds kind of vindictive and mean, and I don't think it's vindictive. I think this is what God is saying, is like, this is the only way to escape death, and I'm trying to help you. (laughs) This is the one way to do it. It's through Jesus, and I'm trying to help you. And that's why we need to listen to what Jesus had to say. Verse 24, And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him proclaim these days. So that's David, that's Jeremiah, that's Isaiah, that's Ezekiel, all that Jesus did. In the 20th century, a lot of you know this, but I have to bring it up because this passage talks a lot about prophecy and a lot about predictions of what Jesus did. Before the 20th century, we really didn't know if the prophecies of the Old Testament were, were legitimately written before. Now, we believe that they were written before because of the stylistic of the manuscript, the styles of the manuscripts, uh, what was going on at the time, the t- t- certain types of, um, of language that was used. Like, we could pinpoint it pretty closely that way, but we didn't necessarily have a carbon-dated document proving that Isaiah or the Old Testament or good chunks of the Old Testament were written before Christ until the Dead Sea Scrolls. Specifically, the Dead Sea Scrolls or the great Isaiah scroll. Here's a picture of it. This scroll is a near full copy of the book of Isaiah, and it was carbon dated to 125 B.C. And what is in this scroll is what you have in your Bible. This is crazy. So, like, this is amazing. Because in Isaiah, you have probably the most proliferous amount of predictions of Jesus. And isn't it interesting that that's the scroll that God decided to have a full copy of that we would discover in the 20th century? Coincidence? I think not, right? So here's what we're going. In Isaiah 9-6, I'm just going to read off some of these prophecies. Remember, you would, this would have been written minimum 125 years before Christ, more likely five or 600 years before Christ, but proven 125 years before Christ, which would have put us at roughly 1900 if we were doing something. So that would be like picking up a document in 1900, and it said, uh, yeah, this guy named Trump is going to be president in 1900. And we would be like, that's ridiculous, until it actually happens. Here, Go through some of the Isaiah scrolls. Isaiah 9, Isaiah uh, references, Isaiah 9, 6. It says, A child is born, a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So there is going to be a child that's going to be born. He's going to be called God. And he's going to be the hero of the Jewish people and the world. Verse, uh, Isaiah 7, verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall be called God with us. So God is going to come as a baby. God's going to come to earth as a baby. Verse Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2. And it shall come forth a, a shoot from the stump of Jesse, this analogy in poetic language, a branch that shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Messiah would be from the line of David, which is proven in the Gospels. And then you have Isaiah 53, which is crazy because Isaiah 53, if you just, I encourage you, read it this afternoon. It reads like a New Testament passage. Because you have verses like, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by His stripes we are healed. And the Lord has laid on Him the sins of us all. Yeah, right? Like, all of this was written before Christ. 100% proven. And then it even predicts the resurrection. In verses 10 of that passage, it says that the Messiah shall prolong his days, even though he was cut off from the land of the living, and they made his grave with the wicked, yet he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. How can you prolong your days if you're dead? You can't. So that means that the hero, the Messiah, is going to die, and he's going to be God, and yet he's going to come back to life. So anyways, I just had to go through like Isaiah and just because this is incredible to me. Like, I don't know if you guys are excited about this. You can obviously tell that I'm a little excited about this. But this shows that Jesus legitimately is the hero, the Messiah, predicted by prophecy and proven, and you can even say this, and proven by science for these particular prophecies. Right? God is good. And this is real life faith, guys. This, 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 this Jesus that we follow, he's real. And it's true. I know that some of us, like for me personally, like sometimes I, I don't feel like it's true. But you know what? Because it's true, because of stuff like this, it's worth pushing forward and following. Because God loves us and it's real. It's absolutely true. Verse 25, Peter continues his sermon, And you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Peter says, look, this is your heritage. This is what God is doing. This is the legacy. Verse 26, And God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first, to the Jews first, to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. It is a blessing, even though that it doesn't sound like it, but it is a blessing to turn from an erroneous way or the wrong way that you're going in your life. Now, it doesn't feel like a blessing at the time. You want to know why? Because what God is doing is saying, hey, I love you, but you're going the wrong way. You're, you're wrong. And immediately, even in my heart, like if somebody tells me that I'm wrong, I'm like, uh, we'll see about that. Debatable, right? <laughs> but when God tells you that you're wrong, listen, he's not telling you to be mean. He's trying to help you. He wants to, to bless you. And how is this a blessing? How is repentance or turning from it a blessing? It's because you're no longer in sin when you repent and you turn to God. And you ask Jesus to forgive you of everything that you've done wrong. That means that you're going to be saved, that your spiritual slate is completely white clean. You no longer have that spiritual criminal record and you are going to heaven. That's kind of big, right? That's pretty awesome. That's one, spir that's one spiritual blessing. Another blessing is that you will no longer have to affect the future, you will no longer have to experience the future consequences of your future sinful decisions. So in other words, you will be able to avoid a lot of mess. <laughs> that's a good thing. That's an amazing thing. And when you turn away from the wrong and you turn to God in the right, the Bible says in this particular chapter that you will be refreshed because you will be in God's presence. 
because you're turning your heart to him. And now you and God can interact. Sin was in the way, and now it's not anymore. And that's the blessing. You simply have to surrender to him. You simply have to surrender to what God is doing in your life. It's hard. It's hard to say you're wrong. But can I just, just piece of encouragement, something that God's been showing me? It is so much better to not fight God when he tells you you're wrong. It's better just to say, okay, God, even if you don't understand it, you just need to say, okay, God, you're telling me it's wrong. Tell me what I need to do now. You just need to go with it. You just need to, because God loves you. The track record of God in your life is not for evil. The track record of God in your life is for your good, whether we can see it that way or not. The truth is that that is what is, that's what, that's what happening in your life and in mine. And I want to encourage you that when God says no or when God says you're wrong, just listen. Just take a step back and recognize that God is telling you this because he loves you. The Bible says that, that God loves, that, that whom God disciplines, he loves. So that when God comes to you and says, hey, this is something you need to change in your life, he's doing that because he cares. And I would encourage you, go with it. And see what God wants to do in your life. A couple application points, and then we'll wrap up. Number one, pray for the miracle, but trust in God's timing. Application point number one, pray for the miracle, but trust in God's timing. Because God's timing is perfect. I believe that you know, God heals people. Yes, we believe that. God doesn't heal other people. We don't know why exactly. We don't know why. I think it's... Um, I, I don't think it's wise to try and guess. <laughs> I think you just need to say, God, you're, you know what you're doing. We trust you. In the book of John, in John chapter 9, there's another person that has a deformity or, or is disabled from birth, and it's a blind man. He can't see. And they're walking along the road, and they see this blind man, and he's begging, and Peter asks Jesus, hey, Jesus, this blind man, is he, is he blind because he sinned? Or is he blind because his parents sinned? And you know what Jesus told him? My paraphrase. No, 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 no. <laughs> he is blind, Jesus speaking, his words. This man is blind so that the works of God would be revealed in him. I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you, and this is a, this is a thought experiment. Let's say that you have a very severe disability. You're paralyzed, you're blind, you're sick, maybe you have cancer, I don't know. And you have a choice. God could heal you right now, and you'd tell everybody about it, and it would be great, and it would be awesome. Or you would wait. God might heal you later. Or maybe, let's just, for the sake of argument, God doesn't heal you at all. And through your life, 5,000 more people go to heaven. Which one would you choose? Which one would you choose? And, and I, to be honest, I don't know if there is a, is a quote, 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 unquote, right answer. But this is what is happening with the lame man. Because I guarantee you, he probably prayed that God would heal him. And yet, in God's perfect timing, when God said no the previous times, but then God said yes at the right time, because of Peter and John stepping out in faith, and it was the right place at the right time, and he gets healed by the power of God, 5,000 more people get saved. Was it worth it? I'm going to roll in here and say yes. Because God cares about people. God cares about what he's doing. And this does not, and please, 
don't misunderstand me. This does not diminish the pain that people feel when they go through these crazy situations of cancer and chemo and, and being paralyzed or being blind. Like This does not diminish the pain. This does not diminish what they are going through in their life. What I am simply promoting to you is that even though it sounds cliche, it really is true, Romans 8, 28, that God can take something as terrible as cancer and turn it around for good because God cares about people and God cares about where they're going in eternity. I have friends that are going through cancer. I, I have family members. like I have, I have one family member that is not doing great right now. And yet I know that God is good, even in the midst of all of that. That sometimes God heals and it's wonderful. Perfect example, my grandfather. My grandfather taught that he, he had a heart condition in the, in the, I think the 70s or the 80s, a long time ago. And God healed him of that. And now my grandfather, who is 95, he, we almost lost him back in March, I believe. And I asked the Lord, I was like, Lord, is this his time or is this, do you have something left for him to do? And we prayed about it together and he said, I think God has more for me to do. And you know what's crazy? Is the instant rebound out of that ICU unit. And now he's back home. Now he's, he's 95, so he's, you know, he's old, right? <laughs> there's, there's issues there. But you know what? Like when God says he has something for you to do, he's going to enable you to do it. If God could heal you of something right now, would you take that path? Or if God said, hey, through your life, if I don't heal you, 5,000 more people will go to heaven. Which one would you choose? And you don't have to answer that right now. I would encourage you to pray about something. I'll pray about that. Which one would you choose? That's hard. Cho that's a hard choice. Joni Erickson Tata. Many of you know her. She had a, a diving accident. She was paralyzed uh, from the neck down. And depression set in, and she was suicidal. And she asked questions, God, why would you let this happen to me? God, why did you do this? And those are things that she really wrestled with. But you know what? She turned to God. And guaranteed times of refreshment came in the presence of the Lord for Joni Erickson Tata. And then God started using her in ways that she never thought possible. The reach that God has given her and the voice that God has given her guaranteed is more now with her disability than ever before her diving accident. Tens of thousands of people have been changed by her, have been inspired by her as she shares. She, I don't know if you know this, but she paints pictures with a, with a, with a paintbrush in her teeth. And she paints pictures. And she goes on podcasts, and she speaks, and she tells people that God is good. Like, how incredible is that? The Joni Erickson taught of like God, God totally used the accident. God took the evil or the bad and God used it for good. And I just want to encourage you guys that God is good no matter what happens. That we need to have that eternal perspective. That this life is 100 years at best. And God wants to do something in your life, I believe, that's bigger than you realize and that what I realize. And then we need to say, God, I surrender. And whatever you want to do, I'm open. Now, it's not, just to, just to clarify, it's not wrong to pray, God, I don't want to have you know, cancer, but I still want to be used by you, right? That's not a bad thing to pray for, right? <laughs> That's okay. Even Paul the apostle had a thorn in his flesh, and he prayed that Jesus would take it away three times. And you know what Jesus' response was? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. It's not wrong to pray for healing. It's not because God does heal. It's not wrong to pray for those things. But sometimes God says, my grace is here for you. And I want to use you in ways that you never thought possible. Lastly, some of you need to be refreshed this morning. 
Some of you need that refreshment from God's presence, turning from the other things from sin and turning to God. And for Christians, and this is just my personal example, for Christians, maybe it's, maybe it's sin, but I think for Christians, particularly here in America, it's not so much sin, I think it's inaction or indifference. In other words, let's turn from doing nothing and let's turn to the Lord and let's see what he wants to do. Let's turn from apathy, which is hard to get out of, by the way. I don't know if you guys have been super apathetic about something and you try to like muster yourself out of it. Just don't muster yourself out of it. Pray yourself out of it. Really say, God, I, I'm done with this and I want to turn to you. The, the apathy is what's, what's crushing you and all those different things. Like, let God use you. Let God fill you. Let God empower you. Let God refresh you when you turn to him and be in his presence. And that takes time. It takes time to spend time with God. It takes time to be in his presence. There's some times when, when God speaks to me and it's like, a, it's like a microwave faith minute where I'm like, man, like I got so much out of that minute with Jesus. That was incredible. And, then the, and there's other times where I spend maybe a half an hour or, or an hour with Jesus and I get one, one little thing. It's like, oh, that, that was nice. It's okay. Like, you know, the point is, is that you're spending time with God. The point is that you're spending time in his presence. And whatever God gives you, just say, praise God. It's amazing. It's awesome. When we repent, God turns it into a blessing. And you could just simply be in a grind. You could simply be in the grind of life. Maybe that's, you know, just, hey, maybe, um, huh, preaching to myself now, maybe it's not apathy that you need to repent from. Maybe it's busyness. It's the busyness that you need to take, just take that, make time, turn to God. See, God wants to spend time with you and me. And I want to, I, I want to pray for all of us myself included, because that last one hit me like a zinger. I want to pray for all of us that we have those times of refreshment from the Lord. So let's all stand and let's pray together.